Hi, this is Peter Bergen. I'm Vice President at New America um, for Global Studies and Fellows. Um, Hassan Abbas, uh, Professor Hassan Abbas is a distinguished professor of international relations at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at National Defense University. He's also a former national fellow at New America, uh, and he's the author of multiple books, including the Taliban Revival and the Prophet's Heir, which actually that book was uh, part of his project uh, when he was a New America fellow. Uh, he's the author of this new book, uh, The Return of the Taliban, which uh, in a kind of cosmic coincidence was is reviewed in the current New York Review of Books by Steve Cole, uh, favorably reviewed, uh, who was former uh, president of and CEO of New America. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to have Professor Abbas uh, on the program uh, today. And um, he's going to talk about some of the big themes and, and stories in his book. And then I'll engage him in a little bit of Q&A and I will also moderate questions from the audience. If you have a question, as uh, put it in the Slido, and I'll uh, I'll feed them to Professor Abbas as we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Peter. I'm really delighted and honored to be here, and I'm really grateful. Also, I remember our, our first meeting, maybe I think 20 years ago, right after 9/11, and our conversations on the profiles of those terrorists. Um, thank you for your support um, over the last two decades or so. Um, my comments today and my remarks uh, may sound a bit uh, more dramatic and that I owe to my voice because of the allergies. Uh, so it's, um, I'll try to speak a bit slowly and may have to sip tea throughout. So bear with me for that. Uh, first and foremost, I think um, I would frame uh, that this book is a story of the latest twist in the history and dynamics of Taliban. Uh, this book is also about U.S. negotiations with Taliban, the Doha deal. Um, you cannot understand the return of the Taliban or the Taliban revival or the resurgence without understanding those critical almost two years when these extensive conversations were happening in Doha. Actually, longer than that, the Europeans expand that span to about four years also, but two years kind of more extensive. The book is also... And one on, on a lighter note in, about those no, Doha negotiations, uh, perhaps we will not know the full story of Doha negotiations unless we have access to what I'm told by many friends who are aware of this, uh, the, the WhatsApp messaging record between Zalmay Khalilzad, the ambassador, and Mullah Baradar, because most of the conversations on the sidelines happen on those WhatsApp messages, I'm told. The book is also about Taliban.gov, um, meaning the personalities and, and the policies of Taliban, uh, which I must say upfront, um, in some ways are quite distinct and different from what had happened in, under the Taliban one government. And in the book, I have explained Taliban 1.0 as those, the original movement in their first uh, experience in the government from 1996 to 99 or 2000, you can say. Uh, second, Taliban 2.0, I frame as the insurgency years, because those are the years Taliban had gone into their sanctuary in the Pakistan Afghanistan border region in Quetta, some in Karachi, elsewhere, and then they resurrected. Um, then there were these shadow governments. They 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 had a new strategy, which was completely different from when they were in government the first time or from the years of the movement. That is in itself a, a different um, set of circumstances and policies. Taliban 2.0 and Taliban 3.0. I frame it from uh, from the years 2019 onwards when the negotiations happen, and of course in the last two years or so. And uh, the book is also last but not the least about the Afghan people, uh, because they are the ones who are the victims of not only these last um, two years specifically, I mean the, and but the last 20 years of insurgency and this half-hearted um, state-building project, and even before that, the the Afghan jihad years. So for the last 40 years or so, Afghan, Afghanistan's and Afghans specifically have been through hell. Just, just one anecdote up front. I was just recently talking to a friend who held a very senior position in Afghan NSC. Um, and um, on the final days, he was appointed um, in a very, very important position. He couldn't reach in time to take up that position. Uh, but when I asked him, and I, because I knew him well, uh, I asked him, I said, oh, sorry, I should have interviewed you before the book. And he said, no, maybe I was not in a position because most of us who struggled so hard to uh, make Afghanistan a new Afghanistan, we have gone through frustration, um, depression of so many different ways. 
this has been so traumatic. So Afghan diaspora and their trauma, not only diaspora is outside, still they have something to look up to in terms of hope, prosperity, some chance to make two ends meet. But those who are in Afghanistan are still struggling. So this is a, this is a book also about the story of the Afghans in that sense. And, and last but not the least, I would argue, uh, this is um, also a bit puzzling. The, the story is about the puzzling part of why after so many years of investment in Afghan security, Afghan police, um, a new leadership, so to say, empowering of the middle class, there was not a single shot that was fired uh, in defiance when Taliban walked into Kabul. We cannot just put that story aside. Something happened. Um, I think that is should not have been that puzzling uh, for those who have um, spent some time understanding the history of Afghanistan. If we had known the history of Afghanistan, um, that, that should not have been that puzzling. But the, these are the range of issues um, that I have talked in the book. But I'll pick about four topics um, in the first, first about remaining uh, 12, 13 minutes or so to, to briefly touch upon. And um, these are the main themes. Uh, I'll begin with also, again, a story. Um, this is about the final moments of um, the collapse of Kabul, if you may call that, the, the escape of Ashraf Ghani. And I must add, I had one part of the story which I uh, which had heard from some very, very credible sources. And this is an academic book. I am where my hat is in, acad ac ac uh, in part of academia. Um, so the, these things have to be verified uh, many more times and I had to be much more careful. But um, a lot of information I received after the book was published because many um, officials, many members of the government, Ghani government, others who reached out to me and said, uh, either your story is incomplete or some said incorrect or some, some added the new aspect. So uh, I hope the paperback will have a, even a more fuller story. But the story goes like this. What I have mentioned in the book, in the final moments, um, Ashraf Ghani, uh, when he, he had intentionally decided not to be part of the negotiation deal, to give credit to Zalma Khalilza to some extent, there's a lot of discredit also for the Doha deal, but the credit is, I mean, he tried till the end to involve Ashraf Ghani. And Ashraf Ghani was convinced because of his old history uh, of last about, at that time, 30, 40, 40 years, that he, he was believing in a conspiracy theory, which was that it is between Zalmi Khalil Zad, Karzai, and Mullah Brother, that three of them together want to build this new, have this new government in Afghanistan by kicking out Ashraf Ghani. He, he thought it was a lot of this was about himself. So a plane was waiting. This is what I've mentioned in the book. And the, and in the final moments, just as a reaction, as a revenge, um, he gave a tip to, to, uh, to the Haqqanis. Um, and we know that Haqqanis were among the first ones to rush into the, uh, Kabul. And that is very important because Taliban is not a monolithic group. They, they had so many different factions and powerful groups. Whosoever was um, at that time supposed to get its um, their hand or their kind of control in important ministries in Kabul were supposed to get uh, more power. And uh, Ghani and uh, Haqqanis were among the very first ones. That's why Ministry of Interior was in his, his hand. He was powerful otherwise also, but he was strategically ahead of others. And the, the, the view is that he got a tip from them, the Ghani, and the Ghani gave the tip, which sounds initially when I heard was um, impossible. But when, when I got this confirmation, because he wanted, Ashraf Ghani wanted to take revenge from from Zalim Khalil Zad, from Baradar, from Karzai, not to allow Mullah Baradar to be at the helm of affairs. Now, the second part of the, the story is that it was not only one plane that was waiting at the Ka Kabul airport for Ashraf Ghani. Uh, that was, of course, the from UAE to take him first to a Central Asian destination and then from, from there to, uh, to, to UAE. But there was another plane also from, from Qatar Airways which was also ready. And in that case, Anas Haqqani was involved. Some of the very, very famous and very respected uh, uh, um, Gilani family was involved. There were some others. And Karzai was on board. In, Karzai was really on board on this story, um, a, as I heard. And this day, the plan was that Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah will be taken to Doha. And there will be an interim government in place, led by Mullah Hibatullah, who will stay in Kandahar. But the cabinet in Kabul will have some members of the previous government from Ashraf Ghani, including Karzai and so many others, and 
some of the Taliban members and this government in Kabul will be led by Mullah Brother. Now, the reason only I'm mentioning, spending some time explaining this is that if that had happened, the second uh, story or the second plan had worked out, um, things would have looked much more in control or because Mullah Brother, and this I now come to my second part of my point, which is Mullah Brother represent uh, part of Taliban who were seen as pragmatic. I'm intentionally avoiding using the word um, um, moderate because that has other, other connotations, but pragmatic for sure. He had spent so much time in jail in the Pakistani um, guest houses as well, where he was mistreated for sure. And he had gone through a rethinking. And this he was not alone in this rethinking. There were many other Taliban leaders who had gone through this rethinking. Um, um, uh, Mullah Wasik, uh, who's the head of the Taliban intelligence today, um, according to official uh, uh, public announcements, uh, he met uh, the deputy director of CIA at least twice in recent months uh, because of some discussions on, on Daesh or Islamic State of Khurasan, as we call that. Um, so there, there are others as well, uh, Khair Khwa. Um, there are other names I will not mention because I was told they, their position is very precarious. The, 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 the point that I'm re leading to um, is my second major point after, after, the, after the whole um, conspiratorial theory of what happened in the last days is that there are, these, uh, there, there are divisions within Taliban which are very important for us to understand. Even if we leave out the history, what has happened has happened in the prevailing circumstances it is Taliban in Kandahar, led by Mullah, Mullah Hibatullah, who is um, someone who is very different in orientation, in his religious perspective, in his uh, worldview, which is very dogmatic, very extremist. Um, his speeches tell us, and also that is reflected by the Chief Justice uh, Abdul um, Hakim Ishaqzai, whose book I had a chance to read, and I have mentioned that in detail in the book. It's a book, uh, it's about the governance system. He has given a new model. And the book is uh, not only full of bigotry, it is, uh, it is traumatic actually to read that book for any person. And any, if I may wear that, that hat, as, as a Muslim reading that book, because the, the extremist and distorted version of Islam um, that, that this brand of Taliban believe in is very, very painful uh, and, and uh, problematic. But that is what Kandahar is. Um, that is what they, the Kandahar hardcore Taliban are known for. And when I had asked this one question to many um, officials in Pakistan, in Central Asian states as well, um, some Americans who, had fo who were following this very closely as part of their duty, everyone who I asked, have Taliban changed? They said, no, not ideologically. And that is true for those who are in Kandahar today. The, how those in Kabul, it's, it's, it's a different story in many ways. And these are the ones, for instance, um, unlike the Taliban 1.0, uh, that this Taliban 3.0 has members who have a couple of them have PhDs from Islamic University in Islamabad. I have confirmed that um, Islamic University in Islamabad is, is not a traditional madrasa. It's, it's a modern Islamic university, like many in, um, in, in Malaysia and Indonesia and other places. And um, so they are graduates of there. They, their new cabinet has, um, or leading positions also have one position for the chairman of the board of cricket. In fact, cricket, uh, that position was really sought after. There was a, if there's any fist fight or any, any, any violent act that happened among the Taliban, that was over the position of the top uh, position for the cricket board. Um, there are others, um, un, not normally mentioned in Western media, if I may say, um, those who are Hazara Shias, two of them, a couple of Tajiks and Uzbek. Again, this is not inclusive government in the way we would like to project. And I at times get surprised when we, give them the, the kind of requirement um, to Taliban, be inclusive. Well, we were there for 20 years. We spent a trillion dollar. We tried it. We gave everything into it. Now for us in negotiations to ask them for an inclusive government is kind of a joke, my apologies. Uh, it is, it, they are not going to listen to these things. It was our negotiated deal which provided them a way into Kabul. Um, no one can deny that. I am not against those negotiated deals, and this I'm linking this with my second large point, which is about that the divisions within Taliban. Those who we engaged with in in uh, Doha were mostly those pragmatic elements, or many of them. Some of us now think that they were lying to us. No, they were tr truthful. It is only that the hardliners were mostly not sitting in those negotiations. 
Um, and, uh, and so that part has to be very clear. There were promises made in Doha negotiations that were broken. There are other very, very controversial points of Doha negotiations also, but I'm not going into those details except mention just one point um, that I, I heard from many uh, negotiators uh, from the US side who said, we thought we are going to deal with these extremists um, uh, who will not be able to even converse properly. And they stunned us by their organization, by their coherence, by their following their talking points, by their extraordinary negotiation skills. So those, many of them are now some in Doha, some are holding cabinet positions in Kabul. Um, and this brings me to my last point on those are the people I'm making a case in the book that we need to negotiate with or engage with. Nego negotiations is all, of course, had happened previously, but engagement. And what do we mean by engagement? It is not necessarily recognition. And by the way, in the regional sense, they are, for all practical purposes, already recognized. Uzbekistan is giving them free electricity. Um, they're already now talking, talking to Tajikistan despite the border problems. Pakistan has this, its own uh, linkages and control, uh, not as dominant as before, because now uh, Doha has huge influence also. We, we learned uh, the Prime Minister of Qatar landing in uh, Kandahar, having meeting with Mullah Habatullah, uh, and that, that, was, that explains that influence, UAE, Turkey, they all have influence, and China. Chinese Prime Minister was recently meeting Muttaki, the foreign minister of Taliban, as if he's meeting head of a very important country. So um, Russia also is, is stuck in their own chaos and, and, and um, darkness um, with the Ukraine. So that I'll leave that for the time being. But China and other countries are already engaged with them. For us, the engagement means our interest on security, whether it is about some remnants of Al-Qaeda or, or Daesh, it is about, um, about our investment also of 20 years. I don't think that all that investment is gone to the dogs. Taliban never burnt down Kabul. Taliban, those who went into Kabul, unlike Taliban 1.0, went into the ministries. They tried to hire more people. Of course, they're bigotry about women, girls' education, and that is mostly coming from Kandahar, and there's some defiance to that as well. But to give credit where due, they are trying to, I'll not say modernize, but adapt to the new Afghanistan that they are faced with. That's why engagement might be a word to go. And, and the very last point, I know I've come to the 20 point, a 20 minute um, kind of deadline is a point which uh, in my various other events never got a chance to talk about, which is the, the, the impact of the Deobandi school of thought and what Taliban's rise mean for the political movements in the Islamic world. I think this is, I'm calling this a new religious movement also in some ways. Uh, part of this is very bigoted, part of this is very dogmatic. Uh, but uh, we need to engage with that idea as well, because if this, this, this whole project succeeds also, it has other kind of implications for the regional countries. And that's why Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan, I was in Uzbekistan before the book, interviewed people and I asked them, you're kind of known for your progressive or secular views. Uh, how come this, this kind of warmth with Taliban? And that is, I learned out of fear, because they think there are people in those countries which can be inspired by Taliban. Pakistan is paying through its nose by, by supporting Afghan Taliban, seeing what the Tariq Taliban Pakistan have done. I'll close by <clears throat> this just one paragraph, and that's Peter. I'll end it with this, with the, my last paragraph of my book. Uh, but there, there's something in there which the message is important. Um, I, I argue ultimately, perhaps if those tasked with deciding the fate of Afghanistan were more compassionate and more thoughtful, things would be different today. Sadly, that is not the case. But there are more pages to be written, a destiny to be fulfilled. Only time will tell what the new fate creators will do with their pens. One can only hope they will write in the language of peace and poetry, not the dogma, strife, and sorrow of yesterday's hands. Perhaps the issue at heart was our naive optimism. Have foreign in interventions dangerously reminiscent of colonial endeavors proved to be effective? Ever? I should have added. If there's anything to be said definitely, it is that the Afghan people deserve better. And that hope is not lost. We need to reimagine what and who the Taliban are today. It is worth remembering that shifting the lens from one of guns and graveyards to one of potential and peace is a burning desire and long awaited right of the people of Afghanistan in the land of poets, mystics, and melodies. Peace is not and cannot be impossible. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Professor Abbas. Um, you know, I, when I when I was in uh, Afghanistan, the last time it was controlled by the Taliban, I remember having a conversation with two Afghan pilots. You know, and obviously, and they were flying for Ariana, the the national airline. So obviously, pretty educated um, and pretty relatively sophisticated. And I and I said to them, you know, I, we all know what what's wrong with the Taliban, but um, this was in '97, uh, but they have bought peace. Uh, and they said, well, you can have security in a prison, was their response. So clearly the war has sort of finished. The Taliban have won. They're far better armed this time around. I mean, we left uh, $7 billion. The United States left $7 billion worth of military equipment behind. The National Resistance Front has, is for the moment, uh, really doesn't have, it has no international support. It can't supply itself through Tajikistan like it did uh, the last time it was, you know, in the pre-9-11 era. Um, there isn't any resistance to speak of. Um, and so on the, yeah, on the plus side, the war is over. On the minus side, you have the Taliban better armed, I think more extreme this time around, because I, I, hear, I hear what you say about the pragmatic Taliban. I'm not sure it makes really any difference, because at the end of the day, this is not a democracy or anything close. It's a theocratic dictatorship. And what the commander of the faithful says, even if people disagree with it, they have to go along with it. So since his view is women shouldn't be educated above the age of 12, that women shouldn't work for the United Nations, uh, that women should only work in extremely, you know, like cleaning out women's toilets was what the mayor of Kabul said, um, you know, it, the fact that there is this pragmatic element, I'm not sure it really means anything. It's like saying that, um, you know, there were pragmatists inside Stalin's cabinet. Yeah, that might have been true, <laughs> but but does it really matter? And so that really gets this question of engagement, uh, Professor Abbas, which is obviously, I mean, well, I thought what you said was very interesting, this sort of de facto recognition by the Chinese and the Turks and Qatar and the Pakistanis and Uzbekistan. And I mean, that's all true. And it, to some extent, even the United States, because certainly Tom West and other US officials for specific purposes have had to engage with the Taliban. But what's what's the end game here? I mean, uh, and I, I'm, this is not a, I don't think there's a good answer to this question. I mean, <laughs> because it's a huge, it's a terrible dilemma. You've got this theocratic dictatorship, which is actually, I think, in many ways worse than the last time around. Um, even, even the pre-9-11 Taliban didn't ban you and women from working with the UN, uh, because, of course, the UN is very dependent on women working for it to provide services to millions of Afghans, many of whom are women. <laughs> so, and then on the other hand, you know, if you, if you don't deal with them, 97% of the population is living below at or below the poverty line. There is acute hunger. Um, so it it's a dilemma. And I just be curious to see sorry for my uh, extended question, but you prompted a lot of a lot of questions and thoughts. I mean, what what let's start with uh the United States and then let's just start with uh you know allied countries what if anything should the united states and countries like you know the uk and eu countries be doing and you know you mentioned the de facto recognition in a sense is that sort of good enough with the prime minister of qatar being in coming to speak to the you know is that is that probably the better the best approach out there Thank you so much, Peter. No, I, I really appreciate these comments because these <clears throat> you've touched upon all the important points. Also, these are strong counter arguments to my point. But starting off, for, I mean, of course, when we talk about de democracy and values, these are very important. Uh, but most of our Middle Eastern partners are, are dogmatic authoritarian uh, monarchies. Um, so, so democracy is, is in terms of the partnership is never been the top priority. It should be. Uh, I, I would uh, absolutely agree. When I said pragmatic or why this Taliban are different, and then I'll come to this uh, question on US and allied countries, what we need to do or what the, are the possibilities. And you're right, there are no good answers. 
you right um, they are uh, bigoted or they are extremist in the same way they were before especially the kandahar group the only difference is there is this um, the power equilibrium between kandahar and kabul is something to really watch about there was no such thing before and uh, women yes they are um, uh, curb they step by step they are pushing back uh, in fact uh, but also that there, there is no shuttlecock burkas in kabul the women are also in fact there is if there is any one group which is showing defiance to taliban it is uh, women of afghanistan who are continuously continuously protesting these hazara young women others educated there are so many uh, uh, pictures and videos of that happening in afghanistan regularly i think that 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 is um, that is different also when i talk to many members of the minority communities of the sufi groups and the shia groups there are changes some some changes are very clear for instance unlike the massacres of the shia hazara the last time around in the demolishing of the buddha statue also this time the ashura processions which is the shia mostly commemorated by shias and sufis but also by many sunnis uh, during uh, there's uh, fixed days for that Uh, those days had approached um, right after the taliban takeover in august 2021 taliban allowed that to happen they allowed the black flags that the black flags that tragically are now associated with daesh but those are also the, the black banners are uh, for commemoration uh, of karbala uh, for many shias and sufis those were allowed i interviewed many people i said this in i think one major news network that taliban are not as harsh against the shia hazaras and sufis and i received many calls from my hazara friends from afghanistan also who said this is only for show in the urban areas because they know international media is there uh, they in the rural areas they are kicking out everyone from shias from the jobs they are taking away their land so there there these contradictions there uh, however i would argue that uh, there is relatively more attempt um, of engagement from the taliban side today than was the case in the previous regimes that's why as you mentioned ambassador tom west i think a very thoughtful uh, diplomat he among very uh, our doha office also i think they are regularly meeting people um they they have a very good understanding of of the profiles of different people they are not trying to micromanage perhaps they cannot but if i had to guess about the qatari prime minister's visit to kandahar i would think this was this happened because of the western pressure um most likely us this is my guess and um because hebatullah realizes that he cannot stay in that uh, world that he wants to operate in and he is getting defiance from among all the people surprisingly by uh, by siraj hakani who challenged him twice or thrice and this was not a figment of anyone's imagination because right after that zawiyullah mujahid the spokesperson of taliban a uh, kind of criticized hakani so these debates i'm not saying they have become pluralistic these internal debates and the fact that these debates are not leading to violent conflict is is kind of a sign of hope to me that those pragmatic elements not necessarily siraj hakani it's very hard to categorize him as a pragmatic with um, uh, uh, blood of um, american soldiers and so many others on his hands but in the current circumstances um he he's operating and acting as someone uh, who's on the side of the pragmatics who want to engage with others as well what we can do further is Uh, not try to micromanage, but try to build on the regional consensus. Because I am convinced that if Iran, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkey, UAE, and Qatar, and China maybe these five six countries have a consensus um, on on girls' education, for example, and if their representative of these six seven countries walk into Kabul uh, or to Kandahar and give an ultimatum. that will be more powerful to meet him than anything else and taliban will have to abide by so us will, should be thinking not only of bilateralism which 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 was throughout the case in our engagement other than some allies who were there but honestly ask the brits ask the europeans how much say they had in the our policy making towards taliban or afghanistan during the 20 years you will get different answers and especially it it changed initially it was strong when especially with nato and and those uh, cases it was strong but ultimately it became our decision negotiations were as was our decision so this time around we need to be multilateral we need to engage more with the regional countries because some of our interests are still at stake in afghanistan yeah i mean i i hear you i, I but at the same time you know when the taliban were in power last time three countries did recognize them pakistan 
uh, UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. No one has recognized them this time precisely on the issue of, of girls' education and uh, treatment and women in jobs. Um, it doesn't seem that there are people ready to, to recognize them. I mean, clearly, I think people have made it clear to the Taliban that they're not going to be recognized if they don't change their approach to, to, to women and girls. Uh, but they could, the, their approach has actually got worse in the last two years, not better. I mean, so I, I hold, look, I mean, it'd be great if we could wave a magic wand over this. and they, Because I think what has happened is a classic mirror imaging problem here, which is we assume that because we would do the following in, in, if we were in charge in Afghanistan, we assume that they want international recognition so much that they will actually change their, the key part of their ideology which is a, because that's what we would do. This is a huge mistake that any intelligence professional would not make. In fact, you know, when you spent 20 years fighting a religious war, which you then have a divinely ordained victory, the last thing you're going to do <laughs> is give up what you regard as an, a very important part of your ideology. And I, you know, I, I think that you know, we've been, vic and I say we, I mean, lots of people have been, including the people who negotiated this terrible agreement with the Taliban, suffered from a great deal of wishful thinking about who they are and what they were going to do. And th th they've done nothing. We now have two years of evidence, right? So it's not like, it's almost two years, since August the 15th, 2021. Their repression has actually deepened. And you say that you know, they're not killing Hazaras. Well, that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> and I, by the way, I don't think it's impossible that they might, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, there, we're early days, right? I mean, that, that can change. Uh, and, and certainly, I think, you know, it's not what you're saying about, you know, in the rural areas, it, you know, they're probably actually doing more repression than, than, than is being reported. So I just, you know, I wish, I wish that, that, you know, that all the wishful thinking was true, but it turns out that none of it was true. I agree. Two things. I entirely agree with you, but I entirely, entirely agree with you to an extent that what you mentioned is very, very accurate about and about the Kandahar-based Taliban. I'm seeing those in Kabul um, have a different approach. And for, for example, I was interviewing a senior member of the Taliban, and I asked this question about girls' education, and th this was in, within the last year, just before the book went to press, and I wanted to look at the final things of my conclusions. And he kind of um, confronted me by saying, he said, you think uh, we are not concerned about our daughters? One of my daughters is studying in Qatar. The other one is studying uh, postgraduate um, and want to be a, a PhD a scholar in, in UAE. Many Taliban leaders who are holding important cabinet positions are very clear about these issues. The hope is, I'm saying, that some of them uh, might be able to push and change the agenda or reverse it. And having said that, let's say for the sake of argument, this idea of how extreme they are on the side for a second. The second large point is that tragically is the reality. And in many parts of the world, changes happen, changes ha are happening in Saudi Arabia. Um, so five years ago, whenever we would use the word Wahhabism, we were using it in terms of um, extreme bigotry. Um, the number of people uh, who were under distress in Saudi Arabia in minor minority communities was huge. Women couldn't drive. Um, so this is change of one man, uh, uh, MBS. I'm not saying I'm a big fan of him, but the changes that are happening. Um, so th th that negativity about Wahhabism is, there are many people who, who are rethinking. Things change. The current reality is, and what was happening previously in Saudi Arabia and now, uh, the, the society remains very conservative in certain rural areas. What I'm saying is, this we cannot say that this is just Taliban being very dogmatic. They have some support base in some rural areas where a mix of tribalism, extremist worldview, lack of education is, is forcing them uh, to be on the side of Taliban. It will be better for the internal reaction to happen pushing back Taliban. It will be a great day when Talib Afghans will push back Taliban and there is more democratic order or some of those um, who left Afghanistan with all the investment of them, the, the Dostums, the Ismail Khans, the uh, Ata Muhammad Noors, the Karzais, the Abdullah Abdullahs, they two of them are still there, but many others who we thought are the greatest partners, they are the most enlightened people. Where are they? Because that's, we thought they are bringing pluralism and democracy. None of them stood there 
some of them should have thought about getting killed there so that they could could have some honor in their lives so if those were the partners and if those are the people we are again hoping there are people in washington dc who are making a case today let's start with the nrf the, the opposition support let's the opposition show that they have they are capable of defying it and and then we support them uh, but at the moment taliban are at the helm of affairs i personally think and i'm not happy to have this conclusion i'm very very uh, it's painful for, painful for me uh, being my roots in that region also and seeing what they have done to so many people uh, I, i say it out of very traumatic uh, understanding of these these issues that they are at the helm of affairs they are not going anywhere in 5 to 7 years and it we only have to look we have used the use of force force option before so this time it has to be more creative um some more skill some more pressure push them uh, sanctions i think some of the sanctions are the right way to push them because taliban are not ready to give up electricity taliban with their top members having a million followers on twitter they are dependent on internet they are dependent on all these things these are all tools in our pocket which we can use the day the internet is switched off that's a way we can push them and pressurize them so there are ways still to work with them through diplomatic channels also some pressures which may empower some of the relatively moder- relatively pragmatic elements that that's my point i hope you're right but you know according to the most recent un report and we're going to have another one coming soon you know 41 cabinet or sub cabinet members of the taliban are already sanctioned so it's like you know we've the, the, and also like the history of sanctions as you know hasan is actually producing regime change behavior it's not a very rich example there's all going to be south africa there's all going to be iran during the obama years uh, but generally speaking you know regimes like north korea or the taliban you know the taliban we started we started sanctioning the taliban before 9/11 those sanctions you know so the sanction regime has been around for a long time anyway i and i i hope you're right and i you know when you say they're going to be around for a while i don't disagree uh, in fact i more than don't disagree i completely agree uh for the reasons we've already discussed they're better armed they there's no really strong opposition of any kind what exists is outside in tajikistan it's not it's not inside the country in any meaningful way there are you know pockets of resistance but it's very minor but there are some things that can change the politics around this and i'd like you perhaps to reflect on them so we talked about the azaras you know when obama changed his mind on iraq it's because the isis because isis was threatening genocide on the azidi so you know vice president biden and tony blinken negotiated withdrawal from iraq in december 2011 3 years later obama changed his mind so the politics can change a president trump in 2024 or 2025 could change his mind a president nikki haley could change her mind a you know or a democratic president could change his or her mind um if the if some things change so the, the one thing would be uh the taliban engaging in some sort of ethnic cleansing another would be europeans showing up in afghanistan for training who really uh were clearly planning attacks in europe another would be an attack on an american um target in the region i'm not saying in the united states that seems implausible another would be a major terrorist attack in india that can be traced back to lashkar-e taiba in afghanistan um and the list goes on i mean so i do think the politics right now there it's all good for them and then of course you could have afghans you know if, if there's mass starvation in afghanistan which is not at all out of the question uh that can change the politics around this as well so I think if you want to reflect it maybe on like how the situation might change very important point so i think it can change also uh, in the same train of thought and which i think in comparison to the other cases you mentioned unfortunately more likely um that uh, daesh we know is quite active there still uh, they were able to actually create big trouble for for taliban themselves also um daesh with some more footprint and so many other militant groups like tehreek e taliban pakistan for example uh, pakistan yeah. was trying to convince afghan taliban do something about them hand them over they were not handed over uh, now taliban are saying we'll move them into the other areas so taliban's links with some of these extremist militant organizations are still intact and in this day and age with 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 um, 
with the access to internet and with so many other ways and the ease of move from, from Afghanistan to Pakistan or to Iran or even to Central Asia. And, um, and some terrorist activity happens um, in any European country or in, in the region or God forbid in, in anywhere in these places, um, then things will change very, very quickly. And I was mentioning this to one of my uh, Taliban friends, if I may call it, inter, inter, one of the interlocutors who's a common friend between the Taliban and myself who arranged many interviews for me in Afghanistan. Um, I was mentioning this to him. He, he said, this is, this is one of the factors at play. Previously, we knew that Siraj Haqqani's, we even had just one picture of him on the FBI website. We, we were not fully aware of where their military commanders are. Now we have a much better picture. If we could take out Al Zawahiri inside Kabul, we know where the office, offices of Ministry of Interior, Defense are. Uh, so these people are much more people are, I not say they are setting ducks, but they, uh, we have much better idea about their whereabouts and uh, the drone technology has also improved significantly. So they know also that if things change, um, it, it'll be 15 strikes in the top 15 to 20 people, Taliban leaders, if they are taken out, uh, it will have a huge impact. Let me so, ask you, uh, Hassan, so you're a former senior Pakistani police officer, and uh, so you mentioned the Pakistani Taliban, uh, which seems to a large degree to be now headquartered in Afghanistan. And, you know, this we're talking about policy dilemmas. The Pakistanis got what they wanted, which is the Taliban running Afghanistan. Uh, but at the same time, it comes at a pretty heavy price with the Pakistani Taliban launching a lot of, I mean, the Pakistanis, as you know, the Pakistanis themselves have carried out airstrikes against Pakistani Taliban positions in Afghanistan. So what's your view about where the Pakistanis are in terms of this policy dilemma? The Pakistanis are paying through their nose for their policy blunders. And that is also tragically some, not something new. Um, many of the scholars and experts, um, in, including uh, myself, we have been saying this for a long time, that TTP and Afghan Taliban are two sides of the same coin. And Pakistan decided to continue to support the Afghan Taliban with their sanctuary, whether their families, houses in Quetta or Peshawar or even Karachi. Mullah Omar had died in a hospital, the, the most advanced hospital in Karachi in 2013. So the, the point is Pakistan's looked the other way. And uh, they were totally, they showed as if they are totally surprised when TTP, Afghan Taliban linkage was, it seemed like an unbreakable bond uh, of love and affection and alliance. Um, so the Pakistani policy was initially they started getting some of them back, uh, those peace deals, which had empowered the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan in the first go. So in some ways, I'd see Pakistan has not learned from uh, any lessons. Now they are negotiating. They did uh, some strikes as well um, uh, in Afghanistan. They pushed um, Taliban as well. And Afghan Taliban came out with uh, very strong critical statements, whether it was Mullah Yaqub or some other leaders, because Pakistan is a very unpopular country in Afghanistan today. So their policy options are quite limited. Um, there is some likelihood if TTP becomes stronger, because we are hearing about different groups that had uh, uh, earlier splintered, they are merging. Um, it's only a matter of time, Lashkar-e Jhangvi. Um, there are other extremist groups like LET. Uh, uh, Lashkar-e uh, Taiba is no more that active uh, or, or, or strong like the way they used to be. Uh, they were somewhat dismantled, but Lashkar-e Jhangvi is very strong still. Uh, LET and their linkages with Daesh are very strong. It's only a matter of time. And I think I'd heard one of the US senior officials saying this in a, uh, a congressional testimony as well. It's a matter of six months to one year uh, that these groups will be strong. Pakistan um, is so much stuck in its internal political civil military conflict um, that I'm not sure whether they are spending some real good quality time thinking about Afghanistan. Probably they, they, they will make the same, by, if I have to project, they'll make the same mistake by thinking that Afghan Taliban are their best friends, uh, even if it costs them uh, internally. And that seems to be the, the direction, tragically. In the last quarter of an hour, we're going to turn to uh, audience questions. So first one uh, is from Martin Smith, who's the producer of a really excellent PBS uh, uh, series on the return of the Taliban. Um, and 
His question, he, you, you alluded to these uh, WhatsApp messages between Ambassador Khalilzad and Mullah Barader. He's asking, would you, would you, would these ever come to light? Have you spoken to either man about them? And I would just add, since you've sort of raised this issue, I mean, we, we have the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, you know, pushing for the dissent cable, uh, which is now being read by members of the committee. Um, so you've got that committee pretty active on this. Uh, presumably, they could ask Kalazar to testify and also produce some of these messages. On on Zalman Khalilzad, I can one mention initially when I started talking to people for the book, I interviewed many and almost almost every government official in whether in Department of State or Department of Defense. Um, tried to blame everything on Zalman Khalilzad, uh, but just because of that um, evidence, I, I developed a little sympathy for the man. Because I said, everyone, no one is ready to take the blame. Um, at the end of the day, it was the President of the United States, President Trump, who had given a go-ahead, uh, who we know from various other books also who was often heard shouting in the White House saying, where is my deal? And then Secretary of State at that time was fully on board. So Zarmir Khalilzad was given a task. He was the best man for the task because of his linguistic skills, because of his background, because of his knowledge. Um, so he was trying to accomplish what he was tasked to do. Yes, of course, he, if, he had any, uh, if he had differed in any way, uh, he should have given up. I think he was all for it. He had, he's a politically ambitious man as well. But he was also, also very capable. Um, the way he in, interacted with the Pakistani uh, intelligence and, and uh, Afghans, uh, it was something uh, to be, to be, can, be, uh, can be seen as very skillful in the negotiation terms. However, I heard from many people who were part of the negotiated uh, negotiations that what was happening in the, in the room during the negotiations was often uh, they were missing gaps and they would later on know that in the evening or one of these uh, days in between the negotiations, um, Zalmi Khalilzad continuously was engaged with Mullah Baradar and they were, they were different understandings. And Mullah Baradar at that time was sh shuttling between uh, Afghanistan and between uh, Doha and at times to Pakistan and going to Mullah Habatullah, getting the orders. So Zalman Khalilzad was ahead of the rest of the negotiation team. But then the rest of the negotiation team, who later on is objecting, um, and with all the due respect, at that time, rather than now they have a different position. At that time, they should have gone, either they should have resigned, or they should have gone to their uh, principals and say that this is something wrong happening. The biggest challenge was, with, from Zalman Khalilzad, is forcing Ashraf Ghani to release those 5,000 Taliban uh, leaders, actually not only Taliban, uh, Daesh leaders, Al-Qaeda leaders. I had heard firsthand from those who were responsible for managing them and securing that, uh, that base and where these prisoners were kept, that at least around some say 350, some say 500, but there was a significant number which were so dangerous and about whom we had such solid evidence of their being not only top category terrorists, but having networks, how we let them go is inconceivable for me. I mean, there, was there no C-130 to get them in one plane and take them out? Someone has to be answerable about those questions. But we do know that the final calls made in this regard for by Zalmi Khalilzad, those questions probably will come out. There's an Afghanistan commission also, uh, I'm forgetting the full name, which will investigate these things and look at the lessons learned. We must go through that lesson process. Uh, only then the full story will come out. Yeah, Shamila Chowdhury, who's a former New America fellow, is the co-chair of that commission. And there were a couple of other New America commissioners, Luke Hartig, um, among them. Um, you know, JFK, after the Bay of Pigs, said, defeat, uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. And I, so when, you know, there's a lot of people who are running away from this agreement because it was such a spectacular failure. Um, and, um, you know, and Kalazad is the principal architect of that. Um, so it's not surprising that he's taking, <laughs> and, you know, obviously he was working with the instructions of President Trump and also Secretary Pompeo and President Biden. They went through with the agreement, despite the fact the Taliban wasn't observing key parts of the agreement, which is entering into good faith and negotiations with the Afghan government and also uh, really cracking down on terrorist groups on its territory neither of which it, it did. Uh, so the only part of the agreement the Taliban really went along with was we won't attack the Americans on the way out the door. 
which was a pretty easy thing to do because that's what they wanted to happen. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of other questions. So um, from Mark Kustra, does Pakistan have still ever have as much influence on the Taliban as they did before the fall of the Ghani government? Important question, I think, and I investigated that a bit in more detail, and, and I talked to all the people who were directly working from Pakistan with, with the Taliban. Um, and when the Pakistani intelligence chief had landed uh, Faiz Hamid um, for, for during the cabinet formation years, I think he was able to get five or six of his folks in the cabinet. Um, there was one person, for example, Noor Muhammad Saqib, uh, who's a graduate of Madrasa Haqqaniya, and I talked to Madrasa Haqqaniya folks I had gone to them actually asking them uh, that seven or eight of your members uh, were graduates um, of uh, graduates of Madrasa Haqqaniya now in cabinet. And they corrected me, no, not seven or eight, they are 17. And uh, th that list is in the book as well. Uh, when the negotiation- can I, ask you a quick can I ask you a quick clarification on that? Because that's very interesting. So if you, when you take on the name Haqqani, is that basically saying that you're a graduate of the Haqqaniya Madrasa out in Hatok outside Peshawar? Absolutely. Thank you for asking this. Yes, this is an old madrasa called Madrasa Haqqaniya. Anyone who's a graduate of this madrasa gets this title Haqqaniya. So this is not a tribe. Many of the Siraj Haqqanis and Jalaluddin Haqqani, they are <clears throat> from Zadran tribe. And uh, that's from where the new acting prime minister Kabir also is from that Zadran tribe. Uh, but this is a, this is a link of, a, this is like a, um, a title, you're from Harvard or Yale or something like that. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with, uh, with, with uh, your, your tribe. And 17 of the graduates of this university are now in the kind of almost 40 member cabinet in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. When I asked them, I said, okay, I want to know about the profiles. There was this, and this is about Pakistan's influence. There's this one person, Noor Muhammad Saqib, who's currently Hajj Affairs Minister, and he was known as the most sectarian of the guys. Some of the anti-Shia and anti-Sufi uh, uh, fatwas, edicts, were given by him in Pakistan. He was seen as such an extremist within Pakistan that the, 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 the Madrasa Haqqaniya thought of failing him at one point. He had certain he wanted to publish some articles. They refused to publish his articles. He's such an extremist. And Taliban were able to get him as a Ministry of Hajj Affairs of all the positions. So Pakistan has influence through the, their government, the intelligence uh, agency. Uh, another example, I asked this uh, to one of the lead Pakistani intelligence agents, that Mullah uh, Yaqub, son of Mullah Umar, who's now the defense minister, that he has been saying nasty things about Pakistan. He laughed and he said, uh, well, his family's in Karachi and we gave him a special plane to go and see his family. Let's see how many times more he can say this about Pakistan. Some of my friends Sorry. said... Okay, but, uh, sorry, so because, because we're running out of time and I want to get to it, uh, as many questions as we can. So there are two questions, one from Felipe and one from uh, Dr. Kieran Pervez. So basically, essentially relates to what you're talking about. Sort of the, what is the influence of the Deobandi tradition on the Taliban? What, is, what, did, and, you know, what does Deobandi mean in this context and how does it influence their thinking? Thank you so much. And I'll be brief. Uh, Deobandi is a subsect, a political sect uh, of the Sunni Hanafi Islam. Within the Sunni, there are four schools of thought. There's Hanafi, which is a traditional Islamic school of thought, mostly followed by people in South Asia. That is a subsect which is linked to a madrasa again. The, these madrasas have done terrible things in, in the region. I mean, sorry, uh, to those who are the followers or who like those for any reason. The Obandi tradition historically was an anti-colonial movement. So it had, it had, it had a political component. And it is still, the Obandi school is still in India today. The Indian Dobandis kind of st stayed towards more middle path. The Pakistani Dobandis uh, started becoming more extremist. Um, the jamaat e ulama islam JUIF, is a big political party. And then this is the Afghan jihad years, which made Dobandi schools in Khyber Pakhtun or Pashtun areas more militant, more assertive, uh, because they were a minority Sunni school in Pakistan. They received most of the funding from, at that time, Gulf and Saudi Arabia. They became, under the dictatorship of Ziaul Haq, more powerful. Today, the Diobandism that Pakistan and Afghanistan sees, and Diobandi initially had no roots in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan had strong Sufi roots also. But today's Diobandism is from Madrasa Haqqaniya. Madrasa Haqqaniya also is more of a traditional school now. 
and then I saw their curriculum. These warmongers and warriors that came out of the Afghan Jihad and the Taliban movement and now holding power in, in, uh, in Kandahar are really part of the problem. That wing or that uh, segment of the Ubandism has become really, really problematic. Uh, and that is very different from the, the mainstream Diobandism in India and Pakistan. Question from Sen Sharing. So uh, about Iran, obviously there have been these border clashes between the Iranians and the Taliban. There was, you know, before the last time the Taliban were in power, you recall the nine Iranian diplomats were killed by the Taliban. They, Iran and Afghanistan almost went to war over that and I think it was 98. So the Iran, the Iran has had this sort of complex relationship with the Taliban. We've had leaders of the Taliban in Iran uh, living. Um, so what what is the state of play right now between Iran and the Taliban? They obviously Iran has a big embassy in Kabul. Uh, there are a lot of Afghan refugees in Iran. Uh, some of those Afghans have been um, recruited for into Iranian militias for sort of Iran's own purposes. So what? How would you characterize the state of play right now? I have a subsection of a chapter on uh, on Iran. Iran is very actively involved in Afghanistan. They have, by and large, a reasonably good relationship with them, surprisingly. And um, mm -hmm. in fact, I heard that uh, Mullah Hebatullah in Kandahar is building a new security force uh, trained, which, which is led by a former Soviet Union trained Afghan colonel. Uh, this is his Noor Zay tribe. But the idea for this new IRCG uh, type unit was given by Iran. Um, some, there was an Iranian delegation. Iranians are the ones who are also not only active in Kabul, but they met Hibatullah also, uh, one of the few uh, senior folks who met uh, Hibatullah as well. And they, they have some influence over that. There are water disputes and others, but uh, the Iranian um, extension or extended uh, kind of space in, in Afghanistan, they are jubilant about it in Herat and other areas as well. Uh, many people think Iran will necessarily work closely with the, uh, with the Afghan Shias or Hazaras. That is not true. Uh, uh, we know that the Iranian strategy was beyond these sectarian networks. And um, I think there are some water problems, but overall, Iran, uh, my, I project Iran will work closely with uh, Taliban in coming years. They, they will offer them um, um, some training support as well. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, and just one I think time for one final question. Um, from Narayan Kumar, um, how, how would you compare the leadership today of the Taliban compared to Mullah Omar? Is there other? Good question. Mullah Omar was not uh, was not uh, trained cleric. Uh, Mullah Hebatullah is. So he, he has more credibility among the religious scholars because he's called in some Sheikh al-Hadith, the, the expert on, on, uh, on, on the Hadith side, which is the, the sayings of uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he, so he, he's more of a cleric and more of, uh, of an educationist. He was never a military commander himself. Um, so he has more, it is in his interest to use the Sharia, their, their distorted version of Sharia model much more. Um, that's why we'll see many edicts. That's why he's he's creating trouble for those in Kabul by telling them. Actually, a Pakistani Diobandi group visited Hibatullah, and he was kind of very rude to them and telling them, "What do you know about uh, Diobandi school? Because I am a teacher of this area." So th this Hibatullah's leadership is less pragmatic. He's less for engagement. He's more theoretical, and he is this illusion. He said that in one of his speeches, and I close with that that. Um, he said that the whole Muslim Ummah is looking at him. The Muslim Ummah is not looking at him. His more success for Hibatullah might be very problematic for the political Islamic movements in the region and even globally. Well, and that raises one quick final question for me, which is, so when um, Hibatullah says that he is the commander of the faithful, he is making the case that he is the commander of all Sunni Muslims as much more than just Afghans, right? True, and that is very problematic. The title, what he used, Amir al Mominin, that was used for the first four very important Islamic uh, 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 caliphs. Um, and no one is challenging him. I get surprised often if he had called himself caliph or, or leader, supreme leader, like the Iranians. Uh, he is in some ways following the Iranian model, I think. Uh, but his, his claim 
that he has this religious authority is actually not accepted even in Pakistan. It is only some Afghans who are close to him who are accepting this. It is only he who is fooling himself, I think, or I would like to believe. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. The book is The Return of the Taliban and a great review in the New York Review of Books. And uh, thank you for sharing your insights and your knowledge today. Um, and thank you to the audience for listening. Thank you so much, Peter. Really appreciate it. Thank you.